Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory to Jesus Christ. It's easy to see the sin of greed in the rich young ruler of this morning's gospel. And greed, or love of money, what St. Paul calls covetousness, which is idolatry, he says, is the root of all evil, as he tells St. Timothy. But the rich young ruler's idolatry, his greed, is not why he could not be saved. In his greed, we can also see the sin of carnal desire. That is, love for the pleasures of the flesh and the sweet things of this life. Not that these things are evil in and of themselves, for they are given us by God himself as a pledge of future blessings. This is what the priest prayer of Vespers teaches us. But they become a snare for us when we begin to live for them in greed. We don't enjoy them in gratitude to God, sharing our blessings with others in need. But in the rich view of ruler's carnal desire, we see the sin of self-love, which St. Maximus says is the root of all evil. So greed, or idolatry, or love of money, and carnal desire, these are but different forms for self, that self-love takes in us. But this too is not why the rich young ruler could not be saved. For who of us can claim that we are not infected with one form or another of this idolatrous, destructive self-love? The self-love of idolatry that is centered on itself. For there is, St. Maximus, the confessor teaches, a healthy and a saving self-love. This healthy self-love desires what is good for us. It makes us it desires what makes us whole and what gives us what give us eternal life. To love God and to be with Him and to be filled with Him. It's like the bride who loves her husband and wants to be with him and to be filled with him and to bear his children. The sin in the rich young ruler this morning that made it so that he could not be saved. The Holy Fathers tell us it was the sin of not repenting. We see the same sin in Judas Iscariot, another lover of money. I submit that he was not lost to perdition because he betrayed the Lord, but because instead of repenting, he gave in to the sin of despair, which is a perverted form of self-love and he hanged himself. What would have happened if Judas had sought, in a heart utterly broken and contrite, forgiveness from the Lord? What if Judas had put all his trust, all his hope? Rather, let's say, what if Judas had given his despair over to the Lord of glory, and not to the Lord of darkness? The Lord Jesus himself tells his disciples, and Judas was there when he said it. He said, with man it is not possible for the rich man, the lover of money, to be saved. But with God, saving even the rich man is possible. But it is not possible if the lover of money will not repent. He who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Draw near to the Lord and he will draw near to you. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Put not your trust in princes and sons of men, in whom there is no salvation. For who but the Lord will rise up for me and stand with me against the host of my sins? When I said, My foot slips, thy mercy, O Lord, held me up. Trust in God and you will be saved, and your flesh will flower again. I acknowledged my sin to thee, and I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. Then thou didst forgive the guilt of my sin. So where is Jesus headed 
When this rich, wrong young ruler comes to him and asks him what he must do to inherit eternal life. If we look in St. Luke, we find that the Savior is passing through Samaria and Galilee on his way to Jerusalem. For his suffering and death on the cross and his three-day burial in the tomb. If we consider this morning's Gospel in its liturgical setting, having just taken leave of the Feast of Theophany this last Friday, when the Lord was baptized by John in the Jordan, we see him coming out of the wilderness where he began his defeat of the devil, coming into the land of Israel to make his way finally to Jerusalem, which is to say that we see the Lord headed for the heavens that were open to him at the Jordan. They are the heavens open to those who would follow the Lord through the wilderness of their own soul and mind, and into his tomb. For it is in his tomb that the stone is rolled away. The tomb is transformed into the gate of heaven. Passing over into the Lord's tomb, quoting from St. Hezekiah, who was about the fifth century, we attain a vision of the Holy of Holies, and we are illumined by Christ with the mysteries, the mysteries of God hidden from the ages. That is to say, we see into the heavens that have been opened. What is set before us is, as it were, a map of the inner exodus of the Gospel. If we are following the Lord Jesus into the wilderness of our soul, in order to make our way with him into the tomb of our heart, we are passing into the place where dwells the Prince of this age, together with all the dark <coughs> spirits that are working in the sons of disobedience, filling their minds and drawing them away from God with carnal desires and thoughts. But as we are stepping onto the path, which is Christ himself, that takes us right into the midst of hell and the evil one's dominion, we are coming into the field of spiritual battle. We are coming into a fight where everything is at stake. Life or death, salvation or perdition, heaven or hell. And our fight is not with flesh and blood, but with dark rulers, authorities, with worldly powers of darkness, and with spirits of evil, who roam the wilderness of our inner man, in our mind and in our soul, and even our body, like roaring lions seeking whom to devour. Who then can be saved? Who of us can stand up to these dark spirits, like the lions, seeking to devour us? The Lord tells us, with man this is impossible. You try it and you will be devoured. <clears throat> but with the Lord everything is possible, including the salvation of us who are lovers of money including us who are drowning in the lusts of carnal desires and thoughts, if we will repent, and in the confession of our sins, cast our burden on the Lord, and put our trust in Him and not in ourselves. Put on the whole armor of God, says St. Paul. St. Hezekiah, whom I just quoted, I think teaches us what are the general materials that constitute the armor of God. We also heard it in this morning's epistle given by St. Paul. St. Hezekiah's our list four main groups, you might say, of this armor of God. The first would be humility. The second would be inner attentiveness to all the thoughts that present themselves to us to discern if they are of God or from another source. The third is fasting. Fasting not just from our, with our stomachs, but fasting from our desires for carnal pleasures. 
fasting with our eyes, fasting with our ears, our nose, our mouth, our hands, our feet, our thoughts, and our desires. And the fourth is prayer. Calling on the name of the Lord in ceaseless mindfulness of His presence in our inner man. And at the root of all this is repentance and the confession of our sins. For we are not saved by ourselves, but by grace, says St. Paul. But what opens us to the salvation of the Lord, the salvation which is possible to God alone, is humility, brokenness of heart, and repentance in the confession of our sins. If you're faithful, with Christmas and Theophany behind us, we have turned the corner. The path goes before us. The path is Christ Jesus himself. He blazes the trail up into the open heavens, right through the horde of demons and dark spirits, routing them before us as if the Lord routed the Egyptians in the Red Sea. This is the path of great plant. It leads through the wilderness, it leads through the air of our inner man, our thoughts and our desires, all the way to the tomb first of our own heart, tomb of Lazarus, and then it goes even deeper into the tomb of the Lord's Sabbath rest. Follow this path, walk on this path, and we will be cleansed and we will become heirs of eternal life. In this in-between time that we now stand in, when the feasts of Christmas and Theophany are behind us, and the opening of the Lent and Triodine is yet several weeks ahead of us, we should not be slack in our inner man. We should be getting ourselves ready to present ourselves to the Lord as though we are the rich young ruler. For who of us isn't? But let us learn the lesson of this morning's gospel. What will send us to perdition is not our sins, but our refusal to repent of them, and our seeking refuge not in Christ the Lord, but in our own riches. Let us begin now to cultivate inner attentiveness to discern in what direction our heart is turned. And let us work to become obedient to the Lord's commandment to repent. Let's begin preparing the way of our soul, setting the paths of our inner man straight by turning our inner attention onto the Lord, seeking Him while He may be found, seeking His help and His mercy in repentance and in the confession of our sins, praying to Him, pleading with Him, asking Him to strengthen us and to help us so that, he, so that we can do what is impossible, but which He calls us to do and which He makes possible in us. To cultivate humility, inner attentiveness, self-denial and prayer in the contrite spirit of repentance, that we may inherit the eternal life, which is Christ himself. For our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, your glory, honor, and worship. Amen. Most holy God, all who save us. Glory to Jesus Christ.